It's time to let the people be free. Yeah, let's talk about that. Instead of focusing on winning arguments, we're teaching the basic fundamentals of sales and marketing and how we can use them to win in the world of politics, teaching you how to meet people where they're at on the issues they care about. Welcome to The Brian Nichols Show. Well, happy Thursday to everybody. Brian Nichols here on The Brian Nichols Show, and thank you for joining us on, of course, another fun-filled episode. I am, as always, your humble host, joining you live from our Stratus IP studios here in lovely Eastern Indiana. Don't let cyber attacks or outdated business technology put your company at risk. Learn more at briannicholshow.com forward slash Stratus IP. Yes, it is time to, in fact, let the people be free. And what better way to do so than to have another, yes, another libertarian candidate. Yes, in fact, running for city council down in Jacksonville, Florida, joining us today. On the Brian Nichols Show, Ron Tracy Robinson, thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. Ron, I'm so excited to have you on the show. Uh, again, another city council candidate from Jacksonville with the big L next to their name. So I appreciate that. But yeah, that's right. We had Eric Parker here on the show back on Monday. Monday? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Monday. And uh, we're having you here on the show today. Uh, yeah, it's Jackson's, Jacksonville City, Florida week, it seems like. But uh, you're... One of our candidates here running, uh, there's three candidates running for city council as libertarians, so we must complete the trifecta. But first, before we go ahead and start talking about all things Jacksonville and libertarianism and messaging, do us a favor. Introduce yourself to the Brian Nichols Show audience, and why are you running for office as one of the three libertarian candidates there in uh, Jacksonville, Florida? My name is Ronald Tracy Robinson. I was born and raised in Jacksonville, Florida. All my life, I, um, I went to First Coast High School, graduated from there in 2009. Then I went straight into the workforce. Now I'm working for General Electric, and I am an uh, inventory specialist. I've been there for about close to five years now. Now, what inspired me to run for office was the fact that during COVID-19, in that time, me being an inventory specialist, I had a really kind of really good insight of how the government intervention into the free market affected the supply chain and how much of a bill and a deficit that it plunged us all all into because you know at my job we have a really big map of all the facilities that we have and all the uh, you know the uh, the, uh, the pro product that's coming in and how much it costs for it to get there to the dock so they can go and pick it up and send it to the warehouses and the bills for how long they were there because of the shutdown went up into the billions and of, of course because of that our gdp ended up going down our gross domestic product and um, that was just one aspect of the reason why I uh, decided to run. Another reason why I decided to run was the fact that in Jacksonville, our current mayor, um, a Republican, ended up shutting down the city um, under the really nice and fuzzy name uh, Safer at Home um, law or whatever. And what that did was wipe out 130 businesses plus in Jacksonville, all the mom and pop shops that we used to love, that was the lifeblood of the city, and ended up going away like Thanos snap. It just out is gone and 67 percent of those jobs are never going to be coming back right and uh also during that time in september of 2020 the cdc moratorium was being implemented now the cdc moratorium put people in really precarious positions because the people who were renting weren't paying money to the landlords that owned the property and the and these are the guys that weren't even paying before the shutdown and uh when they started paying people to stay at home and they weren't able to uh, to be evicted until they had to go through a court order essentially inter, uh, intervening between a contractual obligation that was consensual between two entities, the landlord and the renter. And when that happened, the housing market ended up being in such a such a mess, the likes of which Jacksonville has never seen before. And because of that, people ended up suffering a lot. There were a lot of break-ins, a, um, a lot of violence going on in the streets because a lot of people just didn't have any outlet or any place to go. My grandmother ended up having her house broken into maybe a couple of weeks after the CDC moratorium because she lives in the what would be considered the hood in Jacksonville, which was at that time the District 8 that I was running for. And, uh, and so when that happened, a lot of companies started coming into Jacksonville and started buying up the homes that were in foreclosure. And once they bought those homes, they ended up taking the debt from the previous tenants and started passing it off to the next person. And prices skyrocket, as you can imagine. And Zillow wants to say that Jacksonville has a really hot housing market and all this type of stuff, but really no, it doesn't. And 
in the news, you will see that they're saying that the mortgage rates for homes have been the lowest in about four months, or now it's become a little bit more affordable, but that's not true either because they just moved debt from one place and moved it to the next. And uh, where they moved it to was in the utility sector. I mean, it's gonna cost a lot more to build houses because of the lumber shortage. Mm. It's gonna cost more for insurance to insure these houses. It's gonna cost a lot more to um, for a, a flame deterrence. It's gonna cost a lot more for a lot of these things. And so, through that time, what inspired me to run was the fact that a lot of the stuff that's going on was coming from a central local government intervention in my city and it's affecting my people directly. And I decided to put my hat into the rain and give it a go. So let's take a step back because I think it's important to kind of reframe because I saw this a lot going from I lived in Philadelphia, PA during COVID. And now granted, right, Jacksonville at least had a Republican mayor, but that didn't really mean too much when they too shut down the city safer at home. How dystopian gross. Um, I know. I know. And that, I sat there and watched my governor tell me I'm essential versus non-essential. And I'm like, I think I feel essential, right? It, aren't, yeah. aren't we essential? If I don't have a job, how do I pay for bills? It, 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 is my job essential? It's essential to me. And, uh, you know, you, you talk about what we experienced in these big cities a lot of folks who didn't live in a big city, I don't think really got to appreciate how weird things got and how weird things still are. And I moved out of Philadelphia a year ago, uh, which I got to tell you was one of the best decisions I ever made. And to to still see the headlines, that's one of the benefits of still getting the news headlines pushed to my phone from Philly is that I get to see what I'm not uh, having to deal with anymore, right? Exactly. Which I totally not missing. And, and that right there just speaks to why it is so important. I think not just to surround yourself with people who share like, like, like values, but also like goals and, and like vision for the future. So I guess I say all of that, right. And, and this might be a hard question, Ron, because you are running for office and you're trying to get people on board with your mission, but is it tough, right. To, to, to run for office in, in a city, but also to live in a city where sometimes it feels like you're the only person who seems to know what's going on in a world of so many other people who just seem to be running around like chickens with their heads cut off. About that is a lot of people in Jacksonville really don't know what's going on. I wouldn't say it's a matter of complete or oh, it's a case on some parts. We just want to, you have either apathy or they don't know at all. And that's what I end up running into in most cases. Some people just don't care. They feel like it doesn't matter what they do, the city's not gonna listen to them. They, you know, they've been doing for so long, going to the city council meetings and giving a very small, you know, a lot of amount of time for them to voice their concerns and nothing gets done. And you know, they're, they're, they're you know, raising up their voices, gathering people together, protesting, but it just seems like it's just not clicking with with these people. I mean, it's, it's really bad because Jacksonville City Council is so freaking huge. There's 19 seats in the council. There's 14 for each individual district, district, one that I'm running in and five that are at large. And then you have this, you know, the council president. And so right. my problem with big government is that the representative ratio shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. The bigger the government, the smaller the citizen. That's how it always is. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, what I do, what I've been doing for my campaign is stressing a lot about outreach and not making it so hard for people to come to me to get information that I want to give to them. That's why, you know, before we, we started the show, I let people, I let you know that um, throughout the week, I go door to door, house to house, uh, whether it be in neighborhoods, whether it be subdivisions, uh, whether it be businesses, whether it be churches, anywhere where I can go and reach people and hand out my flyers, hand out my cars, hand out my uh, door hangers or whatever I need to do to pretty much evangelize my campaign, let them know what is, what's going on. Some people, they were like, hey man, I already got a candidate that I'm, that I'm going for, that I'm steering. But and uh, then I'll say, well, well, have you considered this, that, and a third? Well, have you, has your candidate considered this, that, and a third? And they'll say, oh, well, I never really uh, thought about that. Okay, thanks for letting me know because most candidates, well, there's no candidate in my race that's speaking about the things that I'm talking about because I reach for the root of the problem as opposed to gnawing on the branches. Of course, you have the, like I said on Twitter, you have these vanilla milk toast candidates that Jacksonville has had for 50 plus years 
and they'll just say the same thing. You know, let's make parks better. Let's bring our communities together. We're one Jacksonville. Let's have civic engagement. Uh, you know, it's, a, you know, all that really that lame all the stuff. empty platitudes, yeah. Yeah, empty platitudes that don't really mean anything, but they never talk about how we can actually get to that, to that point, you know, where we can have proper civic engagement, where we can have business owners having a lot more sovereignty over what they're doing, and how we can reduce the crime rates, you know? But then you get, and so when I go to the people with the most apathy, I find out that they're the most, you know, that like their eyes light up when a libertarian walks into the room because I'm not talking the same stuff. That's their biggest mm -hmm. critique of these politicians because, hey, you're just going to say the same thing. What's going to separate you from the rest of the crowd? And I let them know that, hey, did you know that Jacksonville is $3 billion in debt? And, if, you know, for, and for a million people to pay that off and make the city solvent, we got to pay a tax burden of $10,200 each. You know, and when I started my campaign, it was two billion dollars. But then you had the um, uh, the American Rescue Plan, the stimulus checks coming in, the rental assistance programs, more money allotted from the taxpayers into the stadium for economic stimulation. Even though you had over 130 small businesses, like I mentioned before, that was giving you the economic st uh, stimulation. You know, so they're panicking and trying to compensate for what the mayor ended up destroying essentially in the city that was going to give the prosperity that we were looking for. And or the fact that uh, I let them know, um, as far as infrastructure is concerned, there's an area in Ocean Way in Jacksonville, uh, specifically called Blue, Way, uh, Blue Whale and Moby Dick um, Drive. Yeah, these are actual real uh, streets. And um, I went there and I spoke to these guys and they were submerged in 12 inches of water when Hurricane Irma ended up hitting the city. And they're not even in a flood zone, but they end up flooding and being submerged in so much water. So yeah. many thousands of dollars worth of damages because of the fact that they neglected the infrastructure around that area. There's a pond, there's a creek, and there's a river. Uh, and what happened was the water ended up overflowing in the creek because the culverts, which is the, the, the tube that the water goes through in order to get, hit the river, it was dammed and it was blocked. And so it ended up rising up and then it spilled into the pond and then it went straight into the neighborhoods. And they suffered a lot for it. Children almost died during that time. You know what I mean? Like babies were, you know, laying down and if the mother hadn't woken up or if the, or they say if the dog hadn't jumped on the bed to let them know that it was flooding, then the baby would have drowned and stuff like that. Really whole, like real big horror stories. People in the neighborhoods on boats and kayaks trying to do this, that, and a third. And, and it's just, it was just really, really bad. And the previous uh, councilman during that time, just, he came there, told them what they wanted to hear, all that type of stuff, just for the city engineers to come through, do the bare minimum, and then get the hell out. But what I propose is a free market solution to these issues. There is a ton of COVID replacement companies in Jacksonville that me as a city council person can go and facilitate a sale. You come through, you give us a quote about what we can do to, excuse me, get these culverts fixed. And then I relay that to the community that ben uh, directly benefits from it, and we facilitate a payment plan. You pay for Netflix, you pay for Hulu, you pay for Disney Plus, and all that type of stuff. And we can put our money together for those that consent to it, by the way. Um, put the money together, put a payment plan so we can get it done. And so that the engineers can come through and fix that stuff. And it can be a guaranteed job done because they're paying them directly. Unlike what government does, you keep paying your taxes up front just so they can drag their behind and not do the job in the first place. Right. Because uh, we all know that government is the only business where uh, they fail at the job. They've been paid to do up front and they ask for a raise. That's it. And um, so, yeah, this is it's one of those things I talk about. And it's revealing the problem and how a free market solution can fix it. You know, and the, the average cost to fix a covert is like five thousand dollars. That thing, you know, especially considering that we have about last I checked about forty five thousand people in my district. Like, come on now, there's way more than enough money to go around in order to get these things done in a free market perspective in the private sector. And um, there's no reason why we should be levying extra taxes to uh, for them to do something they should have been done, uh, should have been doing in the first place. And every quarter, once a quarter or so, we keep going on and, and uh, inspecting these infrastructures to make sure that it's up to par because these things haven't been looked at in years. They probably put it down there and then they left it alone. We went through Shamrock Ave, uh, Shamrock Drive South. I believe it was when we were campaigning down there and we just me and my vice chairman of, of the libertarian party who was also my campaign manager and eric parker we ended up just investigating 
where this where this ditch went and where it was going and it was just trash it was just unkept trees all all up in there uh whole shopping carts sitting there and and the water is and, and it's and it's uh, at the end of that um ditch it goes uphill so of course the water's gonna go there and then it come right back around and not have anywhere else to go so it's gonna create flooding and now they're subjected to flooding prices and not even in the flood zone insurance don't even want to mess with them like that anymore or they want to charge them over the head because they're seen more as a financial liability than an asset so you're talking about the just beauty of government monopolies. Let's talk about another government monopoly, and it is in the uh, the spirit of school choice week as we record here today in the uh, the tail end of January. And let's talk about right now education in Jacksonville. Uh, you know, I see this conversation still permeate not just the uh, the local conversation, but it's becoming more of a national conversation. We have folks like our good friend Corey DeAngelis going around. And he is basically Corey DeAngelis, the evangelist, who is going out and getting all these different states on board with uh, funding students, not systems. Really exciting stuff. So talk to us about the advancement of school choice in Jacksonville. Do we see that as an option? And if not, is that something that your campaign will be uh, championing? Absolutely. The thing about schooling in Jacksonville, it's a big gang, man. It's a big corporate body it's its own government of course they have their own charter they have their own um policing unit their own you know all of that type of stuff and um since i'm not running for school board i'm often in disencouraged to talk about what's going on in duval county public schools but since they came after my mortgage last year in order to pay for um the payment uh, to pay for a uh, was it public school teachers then that's where I give my voice. And I'm gonna let you know what that, what that situation was like. Last year, uh, Duval County uh, Public Schools ended up giving the superintendent, her name was Diane Green, a big fat raise, real big fat raise. She gets paid twice as much as the mayor. She gets paid like over $300,000 a year. The mayor only get paid like over a hundred and some thousand and change. And that's amazing. And uh, so my thing is they could have put that same energy into giving the money to these underpaid teachers that they were selling this uh, bill for. And of course I was campaigning and all that and I, I wasn't really paying attention um, until they said, we're gonna raise your property tax millage rate in order to pay for them. That's when I started getting my, my hand into the rain. That's when, I, that's when it became a problem because that's my money that you know, you're taking without my consent in order to so-called pay for under, you know, underpaid teachers. Yes, on my website, uh, talking about the underpaid teacher myth. Now, private schools are paid way less than public school teachers, and that is because parents pay for their work directly, like I was saying before. It's a mantra that I say all the time so people can know the grid to put things in proper perspective when I'm talking about where libertarians stand on a lot of issues. And um, yeah, they pay them directly, and they have twice the graduation rates as public schools. That's because if the teachers don't do their job adequately, then they're gone, you know, because they have to compete within the open market. But uh, public public school teachers, man, they get they get way more fun, they're, uh, way more payments. They're really overpaid, especially for the quality of education they're giving to our kids. And so they got better retirement, pension plans. I mean, vacation time, all that type of stuff. So that article there is just one of those examples where I'm just deconstructing the whole myth of underpaid teachers because that was how they were selling it in order to. Um, take our mortgage in order to pay for public school teachers. So me being a proponent of school choice, that's a definite, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's of course, oh yeah. And one of the ways for me personally as a libertarian, um, if some people ask me, what do I think about school choice? Hey, we need property tax reform because there's no reason why people, especially elders who don't have any children going into school should be paying for other people's kids to go to public school especially knowing the quality of education and whatever the heck that they're teaching in, in these public schools today, man. I mean, it's some sick stuff and they complain about it and they complain about it all the time, but they don't address the root issue and the root cause. And the things that will help school choice and have proper vouchers for these um, other school, schooling institutions would be to have property tax reform that will get rid of the fact that your property taxes are gonna go into these public schools. That will be a big help for me. That is what um, I would advocate for in order to boost that cause. 
Well, Ron, unfortunately, we are already hard-pressed for time, which means, yes, it is time for final thoughts. And I think I will kick things off by saying, you know, this speaks to, I think you mentioned this throughout the, the conversation today, there are opportunities for us to help sell liberty in our everyday lives. We don't have to go out, run for office. You don't have to go out and become a member of your local party. You can just be an average everyday citizen and use those super citizen powers to make a difference by asking questions. And you can sell liberty by asking really thoughtful questions that make people think, to make people say, like you said, oh, I never thought about that before. The more people that we can get to start asking questions, the better chance we have of getting them to start moving away from their status quo solution. So that's my final thoughts for today. Ron, what do you have for us? Man, I just want to say thank you for having me on the show. This was a lot of fun. I mean, I, I feel like I needed this after a long week of, you know, putting foot to the pavement. And I also want to mention that uh, to all the libertarians in Jacksonville, all the ones who were following me, people that support me, uh, continue to support Ronald Tracy Robinson for Jacksonville City Council and District 8 by going to Ron Tracy number four jacks.com and please donate to the to the campaign and don't look at it as just a mere donation look at it as an investment in order for you to have your financial um, independence and so um, yeah go to Ron Tracy number four jacks.com donate a minimum of five dollars and up we need it for you know promotional material such as you know interviews such as this radio interviews uh, television appearances, billboards, and all the like. Uh, road signs, get your road signs on request, send me a message, I'll go and give it to you. Also get the abolish the gas tax uh, road sign as well to let them know what we stand for and who we are as uh, people of Jacksonville that just want to have complete constructive change. All right, folks. Well, there's your call to action and also to help make it easier for you Going to make it as easy as possible by including all those links in the show notes. All you got to do if you're joining us here on the podcast version of the show, which I know 95% of you are, uh, go ahead and swipe there up to briannicholsshow.com. Just click the artwork in your podcast catcher. Should bring you right over where you can go ahead and find today's episode, the entire transcript from today's episode, plus all those aforementioned links. And by the way, did you know you can go ahead and support the show while also getting some awesome libertarian swag that you can rock like? We have our good ideas don't require for snapback. We have our uh, hoodies. We have t-shirts. We have backpacks, garden signs, all that and more over at briannicholsshow.com forward slash shop. Do yourself uh, a favor and use code TBNS at checkout. And also, in the spirit of having so many local candidates on the show recently, I feel compelled to tell you guys about my brand new free ebook, and that is how to what win your local election. It is a free new ebook, and it's going to tell you yes for anybody who's either running for local office, either for the first time you're thinking about running for office, and you want to know what it entails. We're going through messaging, outreach, building your campaign, all that and more. Grab your free copy over at Brian Nichols Show dot com forward slash win local link for that over in the show notes any uh final words for us as we wrap things up today no i think i covered everything uh before once again go to ron tracy number four jacks.com please invest in the campaign so we can achieve financial freedom and independence rock and roll all right folks well with that being said thank you for joining us brian nichols signing off here on the brian nichols show we'll see you tomorrow thanks for listening to the brian nichols show Find more episodes at briannicholsshow.com.